Absolutely, with Glenda and Linda. 
uh, the uh, yeah. organ, so we appreciate that as well. All right. Any other joys and praises this morning? Sandy? I just want to thank the Lord that he kept us safe. Absolutely. Going down to the feet and he brought us home safe. Well, good. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Lord.
uh, to put the Psalms to music. After all, you all probably are well aware and know uh, that the Psalms were the, it was the hymn book of the Hebrew people. They sang those. They didn't just read them, but they sang them. And so uh, I've just been real uh, encouraged that there's been a group who have tried to reintroduce into the life of God's people the singing of the, of the, of the Psalms. And so uh, it's a very familiar tune. Uh, you can see the words that are in, the, in your bulletin or on the screen this morning. Uh, and our psalm is the first psalm, uh, and it's set to the tune of Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. And I think you all will pick up on the three stanzas as we sing the psalms together this morning. Are we going to stand or sing? Let's all stand. Let's all stand. singing a song called The Summons, and the, there's five verses in the song, and the first four verses um, is representative of Jesus summoning us, okay, and so members of our choir are going to be representing Jesus speaking to us, okay, and then the last verse, verse five, whole choir will sing because it's all of us answering God's summons.
Michelle. Thank you, choir. That was a little difficult when you got mask on and the sing. Uh, but, uh, uh, we, we just feel like uh, it just to have the choir back as a part of our worship and to do it safely and uh, even with a little bit of constraint uh, just is a wonderful opportunity to, to, to be able to worship and, and celebrate together. This morning our first reading uh, comes from the book of Jeremiah, the 11th chapter, verses 18 through 20. Wallace will be reading for us. So let us open our ears and our hearts and our lives to hear what God's word has to say to us as uh, Wallace reads for us. The Lord informed me and I knew. Then he helped me see what they were up to. I was like a young lamb led to the slaughter. I didn't realize that they were planning their schemes against me. Let's destroy the tree with its fruit. Let's cut him off from the land of the living so that even any knowledge of him will be wiped out. The Lord of heavenly forces, righteous judge, who tests the heart and the mind, let me see your revenge upon them because I have committed my case to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Our next hymn is hymn number 430. Let's stand if you're able for this hymn. Even ask what it meant. 
And then when Jesus came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked the disciples, what was it you were disputing among yourselves about on the road? But they kept silent. For on the road, they had been in a great dispute about who would be the greatest among them. And Mark says, Jesus sat down. He called the twelve and he said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And then Jesus took a, a little child and he set him in the midst of his disciples. And when he had taken this child into his arms, he said to those gathered round, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but he who sent me. This is the word of God now given to you fine people of God. Thanks be to God. I don't believe that the question of greatness has gone away since the days of Jesus. From Muhammad Ali's signature boast a generation ago, I am the greatest. Is that pretty good? I, mean, yeah. I worked on it. I worked on it. I worked on that this way. I am the greatest. <laughs> to that, uh, to the best known, uh, I guess, slogans from the past two presidential election cycles entitled Make America Great Again or Keep America Great, we continue to discuss and debate what constitutes greatness. And that question really is at the heart of the passage that's chosen for us on this Sunday. For Mark tells us that Jesus is on the way. He's on the way to his death. And on the way, the disciples are in a deep discussion. Arguing amongst themselves, jockeying for a position of importance when the kingdom of God finally comes. And it's obvious that Jesus has already marked out Peter, James, and John for top positions in his cabinet. In fact, when Jesus healed Jairus' daughter, he had taken Peter, James, and John into the house with him while the rest of the disciples cooled their heels outside. And when Jesus traipsed up that mountain to meet up with Moses and Elijah, he takes this same tree all along, Peter, James, and John. It's clear that Jesus favored Peter James and John. So, maybe it was the rest of them who would be working for Peter, James, and John. But they weren't sure. Well, Peter, you know, they liked him well enough. He, he clearly had leadership potential. But Peter had a terrible temper and a tendency to, to shoot from the hip. You never knew what kind of crazy thing might come out of Peter's mouth or what he might just do next. And the disciples, they liked Peter, but they, they weren't real keen on working for Peter. Peter might just be a disaster waiting to happen. And James and John, do you know what they nicknamed and called James and John? Anybody know? Sons of Thunder. That's right. Sons of Thunder. I mean, how would you all like to work for the sons of thunder? Somebody remarked in the congregation prior, I think I did. 
<laughs> so the disciples have been going along and they're arguing among themselves which one is really the greatest of all the twelve. Am I going to be working for you or are you going to be working for me? And when you get to the top, what, what would you like to accomplish? What about Bartholomew? Bartholomew, he was one of the quiet ones. And as you all well know, you've got to watch out for the quiet ones. Pretty soon the quiet ones end up running the whole shebang. Or how about Simon the Zealot? And if Jesus wanted to run off some Romans, I mean, look, Simon the Zealot was his guy. No one hated Romans more than Simon the Zealot. In fact, it was even rumored that Simon kept a knife under his robe and he knew how to use it. So would they all find themselves taking lessons in martial arts from Simon someday? No one really knew. So they talked about it as they walked along behind Jesus. Hopefully all 12 would be great, but who'd be the greatest? Who'd be the hero? Whose name would go down in history? And they wondered about it. And they talked about it. So when they get to Capernaum, Jesus took them inside to the house. And he asked them, uh, fellas, um, what, what, what was it you all were discussing? What, what were you arguing about on the road here? And they were silent. They're embarrassed. They look at the floor and they shuffle their feet, feeling a little bit like a, a kid who's been caught with his hand in the cookie jar. No one even answered, not even Peter, who was always quick to speak up and say something. There's just silence. And Jesus didn't say, well, look, fellas, I know what you all are talking about. And he didn't rebuke the disciples. He just sat down because teachers always sat down to teach. He sat down and he answered the question that had been in the back of all of their minds. What must we do to be the greatest among this bunch? And Jesus says, if any man wants to be first, he shall be last. And he shall be servant of all. What? Uh, say that again. You know how it feels when your head is, is one place, but the person whom you're listening to says something completely out of the blue. It's sort of like you need to turn your head around backwards and listen again. And that's what these disciples needed. Excuse me, Jesus, while I turn my head around backwards. Then say that again. Maybe I'll understand it this time. So Jesus said... If anyone wants to be first, he shall be, what church? Last. Last. And servant of all. Oh, of course. We knew that. But of course they didn't. They didn't have a clue. They were so doltish. So Jesus calls out a little child and he puts that child right there in the midst of these grown men. He puts, them, he puts the child where children are not allowed. And then Jesus scoops up this little child in his arms and he says, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me doesn't receive me but him who sent me. And so there you have it, a little sermon. In fact, I realized it was the first children's sermon. <laughs> Only it wasn't a sermon for children, but about children. But what did the sermon mean? 
What was Jesus talking about when he says, whoever receives one little, such little child in my name receives me? Well, in that culture, people had an obligation to receive people hospitably. When travelers came, you had an obligation to feed them, to put them up overnight, to protect them, to treat them as family. That's what it meant to welcome someone. It meant to take care of their needs, to help them, to feed them, to make them feel welcome. To make them feel like they really were a part of the family. Jesus says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And if you know anything about the disciple dynamic, you know that the disciples weren't inclined to welcome children. They more, most of the time just kind of shoot them away. They ran them off because children are noisy. They run and they jump and they drive us adults crazy with all their energy. You know what I'm saying, church? And they cry and they get dirty and they interrupt at the most inopportune times. But it isn't just children whom we are to welcome. That child stood for anyone who is helpless, Anyone who needs help, anyone who is small or defenseless or hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison. Jesus wants us to help people like that, to defend them, to feed them, to give them a cup of cold water, to welcome them, to clothe them, to visit them. Listen to what Jesus says about that. He says, most certainly I tell you, in as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. The disciples have been arguing about who is the greatest. And sadly, the church today still has a problem with that. People who want to be important, who are ambitious and great. So who is great? Who's great in the church? Is it the preacher? I'd like to think so. <laughs> but it isn't the preacher. Is it the lay leader? They might think so but it isn't. Is it the chairman of the administrative council? They might think it is, but they would be dead wrong. Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who many of you may recognize the name, became world-renowned because of her work that she did with people who were dying. In fact, I think it's fair to say that Dr. Kubler-Ross revolutionized the care that people in hospitals and hospice receive as they are dying. And because of her work, millions of people have experienced a gentler, kinder death because of Dr. Kubler-Ross's work. But it all started it all started one day when Kubler Ross noticed that a particular woman seemed to just have this special touch with the dying patients in, in the hospital. The woman was a simple maintenance worker who made beds, cleaned rooms, and emptied bedpans. But dying people always seemed to be more peaceful when she was around them. So Cooper Ross asked one day, and she stopped the woman in the hall, and she wanted to know this woman's secret. 
What was it about her that made these people dying and in their final days anxious and, 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 and just uptight seem to be more relaxed, at ease, and at peace? So she asked the woman, and listen to what the woman said. She said, Dr. Ross, well, I've been up the mountain and I've been down the mountain. I've lived in many valleys. And she said that the worst was when I was a, a, in a, when I went to a public clinic with my three-year-old daughter in my arms. And before we could see a doctor, She died of pneumonia. So you see, Dr. Ross, I could have become cynical and angry, but instead, I decided to use my pain to help others. She said, I'm no stranger to death. And that is why I'm not afraid to talk and touch those who are dying. I try to give them hope. Kugler Ross promoted this woman. She made this woman a special counselor to the dying in that hospital. But Kugler Ross didn't make this woman great. She just recognized that the woman was already great. Would you like to be great? Great in Jesus' eyes, great in God's eyes? Then find someone who needs help. Somebody who can't pay you back. Someone like a child. Someone like a homeless person or a sick person or a prisoner. Do what you can for that person. Do it in Jesus' name. And if you do that, Jesus will take it personally. And he'll say, you did it to me. And then he will bless your life. Amen? Amen. This morning, our hymn of response is found in the Faith We Sing hymn books of 2176 or on our screen. It is the servant prayer, make me a servant, humble and meek. May that be our prayer today as we stand together and we sing through Make Me a Servant two times.
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, how grateful we are to be able to gather here with our brothers and our sisters and those who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus to recognize and to celebrate your love for us. But Lord, we also come with the great privilege of sharing with you those burdens that are on our hearts, burdens of family and friends in need of your help and healing, burdens to uh, too painful even for words to be spoken outwardly. But we come before you, Lord, knowing that you do care and have invited us to cast all of our cares upon you because you do care for us. So, Lord, we ask that you would hear the prayers of your children here. 
And we pray especially, Lord, for these who have now contracted uh, COVID-19 and are struggling with their health. We pray for Dennis and Carol and for Archie Williams. And Father, we pray that you would be with them in their situations to provide the comfort and care, but also the insight and wisdom from doctors and nursing staff who administer and attend to them. Pray, Lord, that you would watch over them and keep them within your love and grace. That you would heal them and strengthen them. Lord, I pray for Sam Tucker and we pray, Lord, that you would meet her needs and all that she's facing health-wise. We pray that you would heal and would restore her to health and well-being. Continue, Lord, your watch care over us and our lives so that we might continue to share in the fellowship and with the brothers and sisters who are around us. Watch over us, Lord, with your grace and your goodness, forgiving us and sustaining us so that whatever we do, we might serve. Father, we ask that you would answer these in all of our prayers because we ask them in the name of our Lord Jesus who taught us that when we pray, we could just simply pray in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, one thing I, I meant to say, and it hit me in the midst of the prayer, uh, Juanita, uh, my wife, Juanita, has been accepted into the uh, chaplaincy program, uh, began classwork yesterday, or Monday, and uh, she begins clinicals this coming week uh, in the hospital, and uh, that means that she'll be in and out of the hospital, and uh, one of the things that uh, she met with the chaplain, her supervisor at Watauga Medical Center uh, on uh, Thursday, is that she would be going into the COVID ward. So we would ask that you might pray for her uh, safety and well-being. They'll, they'll do everything they said to keep her safe. But as uh, Juanita and I were talking, uh, if she were to be exposed, then she couldn't be among you fine folks. And that breaks our heart because she wants to be here uh, among you all. Uh, so uh, we're thanking the Lord for open doors and opportunities that she got accepted and she made application to the program. Uh, and uh, we, we just pray that the Lord uh, will keep her safe and ask that you all remember her uh, in prayer, that uh, she can stay well and be safe and, uh, and not in danger or have to be isolated from you all in any capacity. So thank you all for that. Uh, we uh, continue to receive our tithes and offerings, though not by the uh, passing of the offering plate, as is uh, the practice of the church, uh, but you can deposit uh, your tithes and offerings in the boxes as uh, you enter and depart through our foyer. Uh, but nonetheless, we want to give thanks and praise uh, for God's provisions and his uh, uh, blessings upon our life. So if you will, let's stand and sing our doxology together. <laughs> Uh, look around. Uh, take note of who maybe is not here this morning. 
Give them a call this week. Tell them you've missed them and that uh, you hope they're doing well. Let them know that we do care and that we look forward to seeing them here in worship with us. Anybody else got any announcements that they need to make this morning? Anything? Choir at 6.30 on Wednesday. Choir 6.30 on Wednesday evening. So come out and join in and be a part of that. All right. Any other announcements? Well, if not, then let me offer this good word of benediction and then we'll sing our closing song. Go forth, my brothers and sisters, filled with the love of our Lord Jesus to share it with all that we meet. Amen. Amen. Amen.